started with colonialism and it somehow doesn't fit with the traditions and cultures of the areas of the various nations of the Arab world. A part of what we're about to see is how it was tied, an indigenous women's movement was tied to nationalism and later on we start to see the split that becomes a part of that argument about whether or not it's native to uh, the women of the region. Uh, from the, peri the period from the 1920s to the 1960s witnessed the rise of a public nationalist uh, women's movement. Uh, the first of these public feminists grounded their feminist consciousness in nationalistic concerns. And this makes sense. If you're talking about an entire nation mobilized to remove an unjust system, feminist uh, consciousness and nationalist consciousness have the same demands. They're looking for the removal of a tyrannical structure and they're seeking uh, self-representation. And so it makes sense that people like Rida Shahrawi would have shown up uh, during this era and were able to tie their very overt and very uh, public feminist discourse to the nationalism that was sweeping through the Arab world as they were getting rid of the various colonial forces. Um, Huda Sharawi um, was uh, the first pet president of the Egyptian Feminist Union, or the EFU. Uh, she was the first president of it. Uh, it consisted primarily of upper and middle class Egyptian women. At its height, it only had about 250 members. Uh, it focused on various issues, uh, particularly women's suffrage, increased education for women, um, and changes in the personal status law. And the personal status laws are laws that have to do with marriage, inheritance, divorce, child custody, etc. Um, while the EFU accomplished only very, very few of its goals, it's credited with setting the stage for uh, later feminist victories. In 1920, she also became the president of the Leftist Women's Central Committee, which was part of her attempt to become involved in the actual politics of, uh, of the Egyptian state. Uh, much to her dismay and to the dismay of women activists like her, once England was removed from power, once Egypt did declare independence, women were not given the right to vote. Uh, and they saw this as a betrayal, essentially, of their involvement in the revolutionary movements to oust empire. Uh, so part of her establishment of the leftist movement of the EFU was to fight for women's suffrage in Egypt in the, uh, in the 20s, which was the same time that the rest of the world was fighting for suffrage, which is, this is an important parallel to keep in mind. That we're, a lot of people will ask me, oh, well, why has it taken so long? And the answer is, it didn't. We were on the same trajectory in a lot of ways. So what happens with uh, Sharawi is um, she walks to uh, with a group of women to the opening of the Egyptian parliament, uh, from which women had been banned and picketed, and she presented them with a list of 32 demands. Um, after she did this in 1924, uh, sorry, 1923, she went, or she had a delegation of Egyptian women to the Ninth Congress of the International Women's Suffrage Alliance in Rome. Uh, and there she gave a speech and advanced her conception of Egyptian feminism and argued that women in ancient Egypt had had equal status to men and only under foreign domination women lost those rights. Um, and she also argued that Islam had granted women equal rights to men, uh, but the Quran had been misinterpreted by those in power. And these are two arguments that have been sustained and that still come up a lot in uh, discussion of women's rights uh, throughout the Arab world. One of the really interesting parts of this is the first part of this argument where she says that they have had rights until colonial rule. If you look at something like the, the personal status laws that I was mentioning, one of the, rule, the laws under that kind of general rubric is called Beitha, which means the house of obedience. Um, it's since been revised and revoked, and it still exists in some sort of strange, mutated way. But the way that, or what Beitha said, essentially, was that the husband had the right to force his wife to stay with him, regardless of how many times she ran away. Um, and there was sort of a a part of the rule which was if she had left three times, because you know, if a woman runs away to her family or to a friend as a result of abuse or anything like that, the rule was that if, three, if it happened three times, he had the right to reject her, but she had no right to divorce. And the way that this worked in terms of the legal system was that she now became a legal non-entity. She had no legal rights at all. And it was almost as though she no longer existed. This law, the Beitha law did not exist in any form prior to uh, the colonialist 
The only place where we see a version of this law is in 18th century England and France, and it was called coverture. And we see that, and part of, you know, you can look at different studies that have to do with the codification of Egyptian laws uh, at the end of, and the end of empire, the beginning of uh, the independent nation. When these laws were codified, a lot of what happens is essentially a rewriting of 18th and 19th century colonial law and a tying of those laws to religious doctrine, which is where it becomes even more difficult for the women to actually get away from these laws or modify these laws. Um, <coughs> when she returned, going back to Shah Ali, when she returned uh, from uh, the 1923 Congress in, uh, conference in Rome, uh, she performed an act that has come to stand as a central symbol of her life. Uh, she stood in the middle of a public straight, uh, train station in Cairo and removed her face veil. This is the first image uh, to ever appear in an Egyptian newspaper uh, of a woman without a face veil. Now, one of the questions that I often get when I show this image to my students is, but she's still veiled, though, technically. I don't see that she's taken off the veil. And we're talking about the difference here now of arguments of class. A lot of people assume, and now a lot of people do make the choice to wear the full niqab based on religious pr um, uh, uh, preferences. At this point, we're looking at arguments of class, not religion. Uh, and think about it practically. You would mo mainly see upper and middle class women who would wear the full niqab. The reason for this is that upper and middle class women were less likely to be working and were more likely to be confined to households or to private spaces. Lower and lower middle class women rarely, if ever, wore that kind of elaborate veiling because those were the types of women who were working. And as any of us know, if you've got a ton of fabric and you're trying to work uh, on a farm, it's probably going to get away. So what she was making was not simply an argument about women's rights, she was also making a class argument. And this is something, again, that a lot of us don't realize has been a part of uh, this course surrounding Arab uh, feminism. Um, she maintained, uh, sorry, she maintained ties with the International Women's Suffrage Alliance for several years. However, in the 1930s, increasingly influenced by the nationalist movement in Palestine, Sharawi and her colleagues began to define nationalism as pan-Arab as opposed to simply Egyptian feminism. Uh, in 1945, she and the EFU played a major role in founding what became the All-Arab Feminist Union. Uh, five Komodaras from Syria, described it as such that basically that part of their um, uh, goal was in order to achieve their nationalist task, we should not only rely on kings, presidents, and other male leaders, but likewise upon women. Zainab al Ghazali, who joined forces with the feminists, declared, quote, in past times as today, the, women, the woman has called for peace and has raised the banner of her right to defend the land and its dignity. Um, what they ended up doing was questioning inherited wisdom passed down by patriarchal structures, authorities, surrogates, governments. They rejected uh, received patterns of thought, and they breached the laws of science. At this point, we're not talking about invisible feminism anymore. A part of what's fascinating about what these women did, what these women did and what actually is most radical about what they did was that they were doing it publicly. They signed their names. They founded journals, with, and they weren't publishing things anonymously. They had photos of their faces. They were releasing statements using their own name. It doesn't seem like a radical act, but in most of these societies, women's voices and names were meant to be private. They were meant to be kept out of sight. They were meant to be kept invisible. Go back to the kind of the conception of the harem, you know, enclosing the women within private spaces. So that the the voices and the names of women were considered aura, which is a term that refers to that which we uh, should be ashamed of or that should be remain hidden. And it's, it's often used uh, as a reference to genitalia, things that you need to keep keeping covered. Uh, in fact, in Saudi Arabia, uh, only recently have they started to revise some of the Aura laws which have to do with whether or not women are allowed to speak at all in public. Uh, so the fact that they were speaking publicly, signing their names, and refusing anonymity, that was the more radical part of their acts as opposed to whether or not they went to a conference in Rome. So they're fighting for visibility as much as anything else. I mean, and you want to think about it in terms of you know how difficult it is to 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 start a feminist movement or to you know think about it in terms of your own frames of reference. 
the first step is visibility. The first step is taking it from that sort of subversive um, uh, secondary narrative into a visible, active, subversive public narrative, which is what women like Huda Sharali did. As we move forward in time, these voices become louder and quieter depending on where we're looking in the Arab world and when colonialism is ending.